This week on Quadriga, German angst, does Merkel have a plan B? Refugees continue to arrive in Germany at the rate of three to 4,000 a day. In a recent poll, 60% of Germans said Chancellor Merkel has lost control of the situation. The sexual assaults in Cologne have prompted calls for tougher border controls and making it easier to deport refugees. How will Chancellor Merkel cope with these new pressures? Does she have an alternative plan? Coming to you from Berlin, Quadriga, the international debate. Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and a very warm welcome to Quadriga. Angela Merkel is still saying we can do it. Is she bluffing? That's one of the questions we want to talk about here today with three guests who've been following the refugee crisis very closely. It's a pleasure to welcome Judy Dempsey. She works as a senior associate at Carnegie Europe and editor-in-chief of Strategic Europe. And she says, for the first time since becoming chancellor in 2005, Merkel has a plan. It's to rescue Europe from falling apart. The problem is that it's a plan without support from other EU member states. And Alan Posner is with us once again. He's an Anglo-German author and regular commentator for the Berlin-based newspaper Die Welt. He thinks Merkel never had a plan, not for the Euro crisis, not for the refugee crisis, not for dealing with populism in Germany and across Europe. And finally, glad to see Eric Kirschbaum once again with us. He's working for Reuters and is currently a correspondent for the Los Angeles Times in Berlin. He says usually Angela Merkel has things figured out with the end result in mind. This time she doesn't seem to have an end in mind and that could cost her and her conservative party dearly this year. So two out of three of you say the chancellor has no plan, neither a plan A nor a plan B. But Alan Posner, she repeats like a mantra the need for, one, quicker processing of asylum applications at home, and B, the need for greater cooperation at home, both within Europe and between the European Union and Turkey. So those sound like elements of a plan. Well, yes. I mean, there are things you have to do. If people apply for asylum, they need to get their application done uh, quickly. And if they are uh, refused, they need to be sent back quickly. Now, if you're talking about a million coming, about half of whom might be applicable, you're going to send 400,000 back? How are you going to do it? That's one thing. Second thing, and more importantly, is that neither within our own coalition, nor within the wider German spectrum, nor within Europe, is anyone there who's going to throw her a lifeline. No one's taking refugees in uh, no other European country in any numbers which are going to help her. Before Turkey does anything, more it's going to be a long time. So, you know, her plan, if this is her plan, let Europe help me, then that plan has failed already. By the way, I think she knows that. We're going to come right back to some of those yeah. obstacles there. Uh, Eric Kirschbaum, if I look at the Chancellor's recent statements, uh, her statement yesterday to her rather recalcitrant Bavarian sister party, her statement in her New Year's address and to her own party meeting in December, I have to say she's sounding more resolute perhaps than at any time <laughs> in her term in office. She says... Putting up border fences, trying to stop refugees at the border is not a workable alternative. She does have a point, doesn't she? Well, she's, she's got the European Union in mind. She's got the future of the European Union in mind. And, and that is a big problem that the people who want her to introduce caps don't really seem to have a plan for either. What's going to happen if they do re, uh, put the border controls back up? It's really going to set the whole EU back a big, a big step. I think Merkel has gotten into trouble because this winter, everybody thought the number of refugees would start to go down. In the winter, nobody would come across anymore, but they're still coming in by 3,000 a day. So they're going to have another million at this rate, at, that, at this rate this year anyway. So that's why there's all this pressure now in the winter on Merkel. She's hoping for a few more, a few more months of time to the next EU summit, but people in her party aren't happy about her, and she is definitely in trouble. I think. Speaking to members of that Bavarian sister party yesterday, Judy Dempsey, Merkel said once again that she's looking to the future, as Eric said, uh, trying to buy a bit more time, said she's counting on two things. One, consultations this week with Turkey, between Turkey and the EU, and number two, yet another meeting of EU leaders in February. Is there any reason to expect that meeting to produce more cooperation than we've seen in the past months? No. 
<laughs> and nor is there any hope that President Erdogan of Turkey is going to cooperate. I mean, he's been stung badly by the whole Islamic State and the recent suicide uh, attacks two weeks ago in Turkey. So I think he's going to be very loath to keep the refugees there, although this is part of the EU package. Secondly, how many summits have the EU had over the refugees? As if they didn't see this problem happening two or three years ago. And there is a plan B on the table at this summit, and it's going to be a plan B that um, many of the 28 member states will not accept. Essentially, be an inner core of countries who will keep the borders open, and an outer core, if you don't cooperate with the refugees, will then the borders will be closed. It may be radical, that's one of the options, but Merkel is not going to be handed any kind of um, support. It's, it's, she's in a very difficult situation. I want you to elaborate uh, on that uh, plan B that you mentioned in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at some of those numerous EU summits and the resolutions that they've issued, which in fact have not been followed up upon. Example, Turkey. The EU has promised Turkey 3 billion euros if it will reduce the number of refugees it allows to come to Europe. But Italy is reported to be blocking the deal. As a result, Turkey is stalling on its end of the agreement. A small part of the Mediterranean Sea is now governed not by the rule of law, but by people smugglers. Example, hotspots. By the end of 2015, Greece was supposed to have set up five refugee reception centers, known as hotspots. But the EU says that so far there's only one. Italy said it would organize six centers, but so far there are only two. Example, redistribution. 160,000 refugees are due to be moved from Greece and Italy to other EU countries. So far, the EU says only a few hundred have been relocated. Why has European solidarity failed to function in this situation? Are some EU states trying to punish Germany because it's a key player in Europe? Alan Posner, last summer, the Hungarian premier referred to the refugee crisis as, quote, Germany's problem. What, if anything, could change that view of the matter? What could finally impel European member states to actually make good on all these different things that they've resolved to do? Well, basically nothing. Um, I mean, Orban, I, I can't even begin to say how, how horrible that statement is because it was Merkel who helped him out of a crisis. We saw all these thousands of refugees in the Budapest main station. Merkel said, come to Germany. So she helped him out of a tight spot. Mr. Orban is just unthankful, but so is everyone, ungrateful, but so is everyone else in, in Europe. And most have much more reason for that than Hungary does. I mean, the fact that the Greeks don't want to help us, you, when, when did we help them in the crisis? The fact that uh, Eastern European states who want to help us, they are angry at us because we've been cooperating too much with Russia over their heads. Everyone has a grudge against Germany, and most of them for good reason, not Mr. Orban, by the way, but most of the others. So they're not going to help Germany. It's not going to happen. But, but from Orban's point of view, Merkel did make it worse by making it look like the gates were open, the, the doors are open, come to Germany, we'll take care of you. And that just added to the number of people going and rushing to get to Europe before the, the gates close. I, I think Merkel's miscalculation is twofold. One is that she hasn't got a strategy to deal with the refugees, but actually she also wanted to believe that welcoming the refugees, opening the borders, would actually trigger a pan-EU response, and it didn't. She was hoping, she was calculating, yes, if I do this, other countries will follow. And they didn't follow for many complicated reasons. So, Judy, you said you could imagine that at the February meeting of the EU that some carrots or at least some sticks might be laid on the table. Can you say another word about that and whether you think that actually will change the calculus of other EU member states? There are two elements uh, being discussed at the moment. One is that um, relieve the pressure on Italy and Greece. Greece clearly cannot deal with the problem. And move more of the refugees, or try to start relocating the refugees to the more prosperous northern countries. Well, you know who that includes, Sweden, but Sweden is closing its doors. Denmark, it's disgraceful what they're doing. Britain, do you think Cameron will do this before the election, uh, the referendum on the EU? This is one of the proposals. I don't see this flying. And the other is, and we have to really watch this, how the German finance ministry will see the future of Europe. The, the one... European 
The one passionate European left among all the EU governments is Wolfgang Schäuble, the finance minister. He knows that if the Schengen open border system collapses, that is the end of the euro, that is the end of the internal market, and the economies will get even weaker. So, you could imagine Schäuble being what he is thinking, well, let's have a, maybe a two-speed Europe, which we always wanted. Those who want to cooperate with the refugees, we keep the borders open. Those who don't want to, like the Central East and East Europeans and other countries, OK, we close, we close the borders. It's highly provocative, and that's where the carrot and sticks could come in. Uh, Eric Kirschbaum, there has been talk in the past of possibly saying to those countries that don't want to cooperate, Eastern European countries, perhaps even some Southern European countries, OK, you don't have to take refugees in and to actually give them asylum, but you have to pay and maybe pay a lot. Would that, that change people's behaviour in Eastern Europe? It could, but you have to get a majority to agree to that and it's probably not going to happen either. The foot draggers in Europe are following the discussion in Germany very closely. They see that Merkel's losing support in Germany. She's been super popular for the last 10 years and all of a sudden support is crumbling. They're, they're, they're following that very closely. They see the debate between the CSU and the CDU. They know Merkel is losing her position and why should they, why should they help her out now, let her sink? Alan Posner, yesterday the Austrian leadership said we want to limit the number of refugees our country will take in. And in all fairness to Austria, they're talking about a limit of 1.5% of their entire population. That is not a small number. Let's look at other countries in the world. US, UK, they haven't taken anything like that number. But leaving that aside briefly, the Austrian leaders also said this is a wake-up call to the rest of Europe. Will that call be heard? Will yes. that change behaviour? Yeah, it will. I mean, this is what's going to happen. I mean, I like uh, Judy's idea or Mr Schäuble's idea, possibly, but that's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is, if Austria closes its borders, that relieves Germany, of course. Basically, mm. they've closed our border for us. Thank you very much, Austria. Macedonia, the same day or the evening of the same day, closed their borders to Greece, so people aren't coming up through Greece uh, and Serbia uh, towards Slovenia and, and Austria. So this is what's... This is the plan B by default. Everyone closes their borders except Germany. M Mrs Merkel pretend that she hasn't closed the borders, but basically she has. Uh, and then, Alan, what happens when people are dying in the winter in the Balkans? And then yeah. what's going to happen? That's also a wake-up call. What would that... Uh... Look, the wake-up call is out there and it's ending the war in Syria yeah. and in Iraq. Totally, totally I mean, this is not, it's not here in Germany, it's not here in Sweden, Austria. It's out there and where is the diplomacy and the power to actually, the political will to stop it? So, Eric Kirschbaum, uh, Europe tends to move very, very slowly. It mm. often acts only if the wolf is at the door. Mm. So, let's say the wolf is at the door in the form of images of refugees freezing in tent cities in the Balkans. Let's say the Chancellor is right, and that does possibly lead to some movement within Europe. Uh, so, simply uh, a need for more time. How much time does she have? How much time does she have when we look at the internal political situation here in Germany? I don't think she has a lot of time left in Germany. I think the, it's closing in quickly on her. The CSU has been banging the drum. More and more people are fed up with the situation, um, especially since the events in Cologne on New Year's Eve. Um, that's really putting the pressure on her. But a year ago, 800 people drowned off the coast of Lampedusa. The EU, oh, this is horrible. And then they went back to business as usual. Nothing really changed. I mean, I hope we don't see, see hundreds of people, thousands of people freezing to death in Greece. But I can imagine it'll be a short reaction with the EU and then it'll be for... It'll go on to the next problem. Um, I don't think Merkel has a lot of time. I think the next few weeks are really going to be decisive for her, how long she'll be chancellor. And this is something, a few months ago we were talking about this, oh, she'll be around forever, but I think she, <laughs> she might not make it to the end of the year. So our title refers to German angst, which may, of course, come as a surprise to some viewers who remember those amazing pictures of warm welcomes last summer, the Willkommenskultur. But the mood has shifted. Let's take a look. September 2015, Germany welcomes refugees with open arms. Four months later, following the sexual assaults in Cologne, the mood has changed. In the past, we sold between 150 and 200 pepper sprays over the course of one year. Now, practically every day, we sell 100 pepper sprays. In several cities, people have joined civilian defense groups. Refugees have suddenly become suspect. 
In one city, male asylum seekers were banned from a public pool after several women said that they'd been harassed. If they don't behave, they're out, period. Local officials in one town called off this year's carnival parade, citing fears of possible Cologne-style attacks. And a mayor in Bavaria sent a busload of Syrian migrants to Chancellor Merkel's office in Berlin because he's upset about her policy on refugees. Is Germany on the verge of a nervous breakdown? Alan Posner, what accounts for the shift in mood and how widespread is it? We had some very egregious examples there, but of course, that is anecdotal. What's the evidence? How great is the anxiety? Well, you know, I think um, New Year's Eve in Cologne, that was a tipping point when uh, over a thousand women in North Rhine-Westphalia, not only in Cologne, but in other uh, cities across the area, were sexually harassed, molested, in one or two cases possibly raped, by people of, they say, uh, North African, Arab, uh, dissent. The, the facts are still murky, but the fact is that a sort of an underlying angst has been there for years, actually. The angst about uh, these testosterone fueled young men suddenly burst out. And people who are, I think we could include this whole round, who are in the liberal center mm -hmm. mainstream, find themselves caught between two fires because you don't want to be anti immigrant, but you certainly don't want to defend attacks on women. And this, I think, has has, has uh, the mood is, uh, means that the mood is turning uglier by the day. Judy Dempsey, statistics show that every second German woman claims to have encountered sexual harassment in the past. Is it truly likely to become more prevalent or more uh, egregious because of this influx of refugees? Sexual harassment is a fact of life in all cultures. I think uh, the whole issue will become more exaggerated and more complicated actually, and, and I think I just wait until the summer comes when women will want to be, feel comfortable wearing shorts or skirts or whatever, and there's going to be quite, uh, there's going to be very different pressures on them. I actually quite worry about this. But on one other thing, when you mentioned, did Cologne change anything? Actually, I think there's a, a a parallel connection. The civil society movements and the volunteer movements, they are asking, when is this going to end? We have we have, we're dealing with 100 people. Next week, it'll be 120. Next week, they want, uh, they want some guidance. When will it stop? And Chancellor Merkel cannot give them that. She can give them no assurances. Eric Kirschbaum, the president of Germany, spoke in Davos this week and said, look, we do need to get the numbers of refugees down because otherwise we have a major problem with the public ability and willingness to absorb the refugees. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And does that mean that the public at this point is really at its absolute limit? It's getting close to the limit. I mean, where exactly the limit is, I don't know. But I think Cologne did change the mood. And I think Gauck does have a bit of a... He's a bit freer to express the view of the public and uh, I think he, he, he realizes that they need to come up with a plan. They need to give the people a sense that we're in control of the situation. Again, Germans love being in control and the sense that their country is running out of control, being overrun by millions of, of refugees each year with no real plan. That's something that's really difficult for Germans to digest. In Cologne, for example, um, for an American, it's unusual to see women walking alone having a good time midnight in a, in a German city. You don't see that in a lot of cities in America. You don't see that in a lot of cities around the world. But Germany has this tremendously liberal, civilized society where everything is so free. And So, but you know, the fact is they had a policing problem in Cologne. They had far too few officers. They drastically underestimated yeah. uh, what would be going on there on New Year's Eve. They're talking about it. They've replaced their police chief. They're hiring new officers. And we're seeing all through Germany one of the most intensive and, I must say, constructive debates on integration that I've heard in my many years in this country. So are we really so sure that they're not capable of getting this under control? They can get it under control, but Germans swing 
swing in, in different directions. They go swinging in the one direction and the other direction. And Cologne, as you mentioned, is the tipping point. It, it, here, a tale of two train stations. We have the Munich train station in September and the Cologne train station on New Year's Eve. Germans have gone to the extreme, the one end, so welcoming, and then to the extreme at the other end. Um, they need a third train station to come up with a <laughs> middle ground. Alan Posner, what yeah. about... Uh, the political leaders. We certainly are seeing that pressure within the Chancellor's party. So far, she's remaining steadfast. What about her junior coalition partner, the SPD? How much support are they still willing to give her? Uh, well, you know, the, 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 politically, the SPD is left already. They're already demanding uh, a limit to, to refugees. I mean, the SPD is overtaking her on the right. Her CSU partner is there already. So she's totally isolated, but they're not going to get a, do away with her. And for one very simple reason, no one wants to take the rap. They want her uh, to, to, get, to take all the flack, to solve the difficulties. Before, you know, you don't want to be Chancellor of Germany at this moment. None of us would like that job because it's an impossible job. That's why they're going to leave it with Merkel. So, so sorry, but back to the title of our program, <laughs> German Anxiety Plan B. Judy Dempsey, clearly she's counting on getting those numbers of the refugees down, some form of European cooperation uh, coming in future. Let's say all of that doesn't happen. What might another plan B look like? The Austrians are calling their decision to impose a cap a plan B. Would that be an alternative for Germany? No. The alternative is actually ending the war in Syria. I go back to this point. Uh, closing borders. Merkel is right on this. Closing borders will not solve the problem. What will solve the problem is getting the Iranians and the Saudis and the neighbours in the region ending this bloody war in Syria. Again, something that will take a considerable amount of time. Yes. Eric Kirschbaum, you told us she doesn't have a lot of time. This Austrian move, reimposing border controls, the Austrians are saying we're only going to let refugees in at one crossing point. Mm. Everywhere else, we're going to shut it down. Is that the beginning of the end of free movement within Europe, the so-called Schengen Agreement? And if so, is that plan B, the breakdown of Schengen? It could be. It could also just be a, a way to pressure the EU to come up with something, because if the borders do go up everywhere and Schengen does fall, e the EU is going to have a problem as well. The economic growth will, will shrivel away. I mean, I think really pivotal is these March elections in these three East German, in three German states. If the CDU candidates get routed there or do poorly, the pressure on Merkel could be so enor enormous that something will break in mid-March. In mar in mid who has a plan B, Ellen Posner? You've told us the Chancellor doesn't. Uh, does one of the other political parties? And do you see a workable plan B? Well, no, the Chancellor, the Chancellor has always said in all the crises, you know, we're driving like in a fog. That's the way she's going. She's been incredibly lucky now that the Austrians have shut the border and the Macedonians. That is, they're right, the Austrians, that's plan B, shut the border. But I agree totally with Judy. We're not going to solve anything until we fix Syria. We've gained some time. We're going to gain some time by closing the borders. Merkel is still there. Now we need the political will. And the terrible tragedy is we're in an American election year where an American that's president right. isn't going to lead on that. That's, that's right. why that's not going to happen. Yeah. That's a tragedy. And a double tragedy is that America's not taking in the refugees to, to lift the pressure off Germany. That's, um, yeah. So, solving the Syrian war, clearly that is not a plan B. That's a plan A. They are working on it. German Foreign Minister Steinmeier as well, very much involved. What kind of prospects do you give the current talks? We're due to see another round early February. I think Iran is a, is a key player in this, of course. And Saudi Arabia has actually been punished with the, with the collapse of the energy prices and it's got its own economic problems now. And it's, it's up to its neck in what it's doing in the war in Yemen. But there must be a meeting of minds among the region and among the Europeans that this war has to end. Waiting for Obama's, the, the end of the Obama era, waiting for a new president to come in. We don't have time in our hands. One other point. There may be a lot of schadenfreude among the Central and East European countries about Merkel, but tell me, do they, do they really want a weakened Germany and to see the end of Chancellor Merkel? Eric Kirschbaum, you told us uh, you think she doesn't have a lot of time. If there were some kind of progress evident on Syria. Do you think that that would buy the Chancellor more support within the population at large? After all, as you said, her poll numbers were sky high just a few months ago. Yeah, it could. I mean, I think she's right that the peace or a nearing peace in Syria could change the whole calculus mm -hmm. of everything. Um, but those are a lot of big ifs, and um, it doesn't look like it's on the imminent horizon. And people in Germany are a bit impatient, so I don't think she has that much time. 
Meanwhile, as we said, much hinges on whether the numbers actually come down, Alan Posner. The government spokesman said yesterday they are falling. Is that just because of winter weather or are Germany's attempts to get the registration process and the process of quickly identifying those refugees who don't have a right to asylum finally beginning to work? Well, it's a combination of all sorts of things. I mean, we're deporting twice as many people as we did a year ago, which uh, is, a, is a good thing, and not letting them hang around. Uh, there's the weather. There's the closing of the borders. Bulgaria's closest border to Greece. M Macedonia's closest border to Greece. All sorts of things are happening. The numbers are coming down, and they will come down. But, but what we don't want to lose sight of is the immense suffering and the humanitarian tragedy that has beset the majority of these refugees. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us today, and thanks to you out there for tuning in. See you soon.